Hello. Hi, everybody. My name is Eric Hines. I'm curator of film at Museum of the Moving Image. And I welcome you to uh, today's live talk with Hubert Sauper. Um, Hubert Sauper is the director of Epicentro, which just opened in virtual cinemas uh, in the US on Friday. Um, it opened in France not that long ago as well. And it was, uh, it premiered at the Sundance Film Festival in January of this year, which feels like a lifetime ago, but indeed was 2020, um, where it won the Grand Jury Prize for World Cinema Documentary Competition. Uh, and it was also the opening night film for First Look, the film festival of Museum of the Moving Image, which was March 11th, 2020. And that also feels like a lifetime ago. Uh, and the last time I saw it, uh, our guest, Hubert Sauper, was uh, two days after that on March 13th, before he returned to France. And uh, it's so great to reconvene with him virtually and to talk about this film that I love very much, uh, which I think is absolutely incredibly essential film uh, that I think has only just begun to start conversations and make a real impression uh, about uh, about all the things that uh, Hubert Sauper uh, had ambitions for in this film, uh, which we'll begin to talk about today. Uh, and I'd love to have Hubert join us in the virtual space right now, if you're out there, Hubert. Okay, I think I'm here. You're here. Can you see me? <laughs> yes. I can see you, hear you, and I'm so happy to see you, my brother. I can see you too. So you're, can you tell us, can you tell us uh, in, in, in a sense where you are right now? <clears throat> I'm uh, in my tiny uh, little farm in, uh, in the middle of nowhere in, in, in the center of France. It's uh, just getting night. Um, there's my little workspace. I don't know if you can see anything. Can you? Uh, and uh, I'm living literally uh, on an island in an ocean, in the green ocean. <laughs> uh, and I'm very happy here. This is my epicenter of work uh, before I start going off again to some place the, on the planet for the next film. Well, I want to um, get to that. Maybe I'm we'll so happy, it. really so happy to see you, uh, Eric. I, I have such great, great, great memories to the last uh, film screening in New York ever. <laughs> <laughs> which was pretty much supposed, it was supposed to be the first one but it was the last you know so it was, it was literally the night after new york closed down and i was running to the airport to get out of out of this town yeah those were those were um yeah. wild days difficult days but uh the fact that that screening of this film uh still stays with me as one of the more profound screenings I've had in, in my career and that I've seen at the museum in, in, in recent times says a lot about the film and actually felt um, like a really appropriate film to have um, as these things were happening to us in New York and in the, in the country and in the world. Um, uh, I want to vel welcome all those, all those who have seen the film over the last couple days or have saw, uh, saw it at its festival screenings. If you have not seen it yet, we'll try um, not to spoil anything. I don't think it's the sort of film where it will be spoiled. So I encourage you to watch it if you haven't yet. Um, and if you're joining us from uh, one of the other cinemas in uh, America, again, my name is Eric Hines and I, I appreciate your joining and your letting me uh, conduct this interview. Um, but uh, absolutely, if you should support your local cinemas wherever you are by seeing the film virtually that way. Hubert, can you, uh, we've talked about this a couple times, but for the sake of, of, of this audience and this conversation, do you mind dialing us back a little bit in terms of where your relationship with Cuba began? Uh, your last two films were in Africa um, and the relationship for you as a European to Africa was a big element to to those films, Darwin's Nightmare and, and, and We Come as Friends. And now um, with, with uh, Epicentro, that's an element again, but in some ways um, I'm sensing a, 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 a real deep connection and almost a sense of residency uh, in terms of your relationship with, with Cuba. And you explore that in the film, but I'd love to know a little bit about the story behind your relationship to Cuba. Yeah, first of all, just give me a, an idea, are we talking to cinema audiences at the same time or are people watching us in, in cinemas or? Not, not in cinemas, no, um, uh, but the way that the virtual cinema works um, through Kino Lorber, the, the distributor of the film, um, it's opening virtually in a number of uh, independent cinemas right. in America. And so they're all tuned in to, to this. So it's not necessarily live. Some people are watching it live. Some people will watch it recorded in the coming days. Let me try to give you an answer. Uh, um, <laughs> First, uh, you you said it just 
now yourself, uh, me as a European, uh, as a filmmaker in general, you try to uh, explore a human condition and, and to try to understand your own story, your own history, your own family, etc. You, you describe your family best when you step a little bit back from it or when you grow a bit older. And as a European, of course, to understand Europe, uh, it, is, it is very much necessary to go to the places where Europe uh, uh, had a had a massive impact, which is the periphery, which is the South, mostly uh, Africa and the Americas. I mean, the Americas is a, was Europeans colonizing, uh, you know, indigenous lands. Um, so, so to understand Europe, I, 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 I wandered around Central Africa and I described, uh, I never made films in, about Sudan or about Tanzania. Darwin's Nightmare was not about Tanzania, it was about human condition, it was a lot about Europeans, uh, uh, what the hell are we doing there and, and what, what am I doing here too. It's a famous Bruce Chatwin book, I think it's called What Am I Doing Here? Um, and so uh, Cuba, Cuba always interested me and I'm not alone, it's, it's kind of, it is, it is an epicenter of, of, of Geopolitics. It's always been. It is the it is the center of uh, the Spanish uh, world empire. It was the Spanish uh, center of the Spanish world empire, and it, it became the place where de facto the, the American empire uh, was was born with the famous explosion of of the main. Uh, most Americans know know the story. Most Europeans don't. It's very interesting because the film opened in in cinemas a week ago in in France, and, uh, and people were really overwhelmed by learning something so elementary about the American history. Mm. Mm. Uh, so as you are in America, we don't need to explain that much more. I think most people in America know, uh, remember the main <laughs> famous line. Um, so, so Cuba was uh, for me, uh, one of these places uh, where of crossroads of, of always has been a crossroads of empires in, in, in in Europe, it would be Sarajevo, where the first world war started. And uh, in, in Asia now, it is, is, is Hong Kong. That's where, where things are being kind of fought out, um, or Taiwan. Um, so, so I went to essentially to go to Cuba to, uh, to kind of uh, sense, get a sense of what is, what is American uh, imperial history. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I, I am I am European. Um, I lived in many countries uh, in Europe, but I'm, I also grew up, quote unquote, in America, mm. because my my parents owned a, a mountain inn uh, near the place where The Sound of Music was uh, filmed, uh, near Salzburg, and uh, and uh, in the small mountain inn was populated um, in the early seventies by uh, U.S. Uh, Air Force personnel, by bomber pilots who had essentially just bombed the shit out of, out of Vietnam, got rid of the green forests with uh, napalm and then came to the green forests of Austria to, to recover and to the end of my parents. So I grew up on, so to say, on the lap of, of American soldiers. Mm -hmm. And that's my relationship to America. And then I, when I was 20, I, I, I lived in America too, for a couple of years. Um, so I'm, I am a European, but I also, have a sense of uh, you know of of what uh, what is um, American history a sense you know I'm not I'm not a specialist of course so um, when I came to Havana I, I saw I was of course looking for things that everyone knows it's it's people say it's it's a history stuck in time it's it's a America a window into the past etc it is by the way also a window into the possible future because it's a post uh, industrial society uh, still going and um, if uh, you know we look at how the world is going now we maybe have seen this on a worldwide scale one day post-industrial world <laughs> who knows you know right. so it is a window into the future and, and into the past it is fascinating for of course Americans it's uh, Havana is uh, was de facto an American US American city uh, until 60 years ago before Castro came and, and Che Guevara uh, and that's of course why we why Americans and Europeans are so fascinated by by these uh, beautiful old cars and uh, uh, and uh, seeing America uh, in a way see America great again <laughs> in a very strange way 
uh, it is a fantasy land. And uh, in Epicenter, I tried, I tried to uh, also figure out a term, which is a European term that is as old as the new world, which is uh, utopia. Mm. Uh, so I don't know, Eric, if I if I should keep going. You're going great. <laughs> You're about the expose of the film, but uh, yeah, as we most people have not seen, seen the film yet, maybe we should a little bit talk about that. So should I? Or, yeah. Well, I, we, let, let, let's let, let's go into that a little bit. But I want I want to, if, if you don't mind, I, I'm also still interested in all the things that you're saying that led you then to. Because what I find so interesting about your films in general and so interesting about Epicentro, or one of the things that I find so interesting is that your impulse as a person and as a filmmaker is to close the distance, is to get as close to people as you can, to get as close to a community as you can. But your films also allow for the kind of self-critique of distance, the idea that you are who you are. So you are coming as close as you can to people, but you're also aware that you are coming from a distance, that you are coming from a different place. And you, 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 you allow for... Your, your films to have both that intimacy and that sort of the critique of distance built in to it. And so I'm just curious about how you, in, in, in coming to Cuba, when you first came, how you started to imagine um, what your job there was, you know, what your job there was, was it to, um, was it about spending time? Was it about making, building relationships? Was it about doing research? How did you kind of, uh, I'm just curious about those initial plans about what, your thought your job there was and then how that evolved over time um well my, my job is is making a movie and, and of course i i i um i have an approach which has uh, which is kind of a, a very privileged uh, one in a way because i get public funding uh, in europe and and i get money in america which allows me to to um, work for two three years essentially what i do is i i I, I just moved to a place where I'm working. So I just moved to Havana, essentially. And I set up camp and uh, on, a, on a, an empty, uh, you know, completely uh, abundant rooftop. Um, and I essentially built with my hands a little shack uh, on the rooftop, which you see, see in the film, by the way, you can see that it's called, uh, one of the kids calls it paradise, you see in a hammock. Uh, so I put some palm trees up in a very sim simple outdoor kitchen, and and I had like this little room, which was my epicenter for, for work. I also edit and shoot simultaneously always. And so I set up camp and 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 uh, accepted to, uh, um, to teach at the film school in Havana, which gave me a very good approach. I mean, a good like uh, carte blanche uh, in relationship to the to the government because you, you cannot just go as a, as a European say like, I live now here. It's a, but now I was invited and I was a professor at least in, as a title uh, at the film school. So I got the Cuban green card and I was known in my neighborhood as a, you know, the, the film guy. And so it was very, it was very, uh, it was a very good way to kind of uh, just be there and then and then slowly create relationships and and create uh, you know uh, the thought about about a future film and um, so I think the, the most important thing is to be somewhere and to kind of live something and experience something uh, fully in in order to translate it into into film, it's it's as simple as that. It's, it's essentially just living something and 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 making a film of this kind is 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 technically nothing. It's just I, I have tiny cameras. I shoot mostly myself. I shoot at night. Uh, I I edit it on my laptop. But what is a very big effort is 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 time and uh, reflection. So you just spend your time thinking and. Mm -hmm. Often without outcome, <laughs> uh, and sometimes with uh, with outcome, you know. <laughs> uh, and uh, writing and making friends. Oh, I cannot hear you now. Oh, can you hear me? So I, I was I was just going to say like the the yeah. knowing that you need that space to think. I think is is wonderful. I think a lot of often filmmakers, for whatever reason, financially, logistically, um, the, the 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 difficulties of maybe having limited time in a space. Mm -hmm that they don't get a chance to allow for, to be, to be in a space, but then also to have those days of thinking and not necessarily being productive in a, in a, in a, in a direct way. Well, I think that 
that comes from a a distortion or it's kind of a, it's kind of a uh, a distortion from the times when cinema was a was only an industrial uh, you know product you know the, the whole idea of, of big crews and big gear and cameras and sound people and uh, uh, all that is is obsolete to me at least the way i work uh, it, I, i'm not saying it's obsolete anyway but 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 uh for for cinema d'auteur for this kind of cinema d'auteur the less the less cables i have to carry the less microphones the better it is you know mm -hmm. um and it is when, when i was in film school uh in the early 90s uh came uh, came we were playing hollywood essentially you know you you have 30 people in a crew to make a, a short film and everyone just somebody's just carrying it uh, cable somebody's this script person somebody's just bringing coffee it's just all this, this hierarchy so we were playing playing hollywood and suddenly came this guy from from holland uh showed us his films and i was just blown away uh how good they were and 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 then we said how did you do that and it's just i just film myself and my wife does the sound and his name was johan van der Keuken. a big a, a major filmmaker and we were all like shit you know this guy is doing it alone and we are 30 and and his films are just so much better <laughs> and they were so much better because he had the freedom uh mm -hmm. to uh, not have a crew mm -hmm. um for, for me this was like the, the liberation absolute liberation was the first time i went to africa in, in 96 uh, i had a high eight camera and i was like out of film school and i was like I was just uh, in heaven, you know, that I could do sound and, and good image and uh, everything in at once. So all I needed to do is figure out how to, what to film and when and how and why. <laughs> so that's, that's what you do as a filmmaker. Uh, yeah. and related to that, can we talk a little bit about, um, I, think, I think that then bears out in your films in how they, they take a very unique shape. I don't think of your films as um, adopting some form that has been previously set out for you. I think your films take the form that they need to take. And I think that they, um, almost as, as text, they, 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 they go everywhere from essay to observation, to, to history, to, um, to criticism. And, 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 and I think that's, um, it's why, I mean, they're extraordinary for that, but that seems to maybe be a result of, of the process that you're talking about, if you're doing it on your own and you're allowing the, 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 the film itself to take shape in front of your eyes, you can then adapt whatever the form is to that. But I'd love to know a little bit about how much you think about form going into it and whether, you know, exactly how the form, like, and, and, and related to that is, is writing, you know, because there's, there's, such, there's an essayistic quality to a film like this where it starts off that way and then, and then goes different directions. Are you writing to start and then in a sense, looking to figure out what to shoot based on what you've set out for yourself or are you writing yeah. at the end? Like how is, how's that all happening? Well, most, most documentary filmmakers uh, or nonfiction filmmakers have to, have to write scripts because you don't get money if you don't. Treatments uh, basically to get funding. Based uh, treatments and, and you write, uh, essentially write a story uh, based on at least one, one journey of uh, research with photos um, and I write a story of uh, who are the characters I met, who are my, what are my thoughts and what are the possible situations and, 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 uh, and um, uh, conversations that could come out. So, so I, I, you know, if you talk about a, a politician somewhere in Africa, I, I in, in essence know what they're talking about. So uh, I, I, I know what NGOs talk about in the Congo when there's a civil war. So I, I take one archetype, I take a few uh, lines and then I put this in a script mm -hmm. that this could be more or less forwarding the, the narrative. Um, so so the, the, the concept, I guess, is, is my films are, unlike you might think, quite conceptual in, a, in the beginning. Mm -hmm. but, but when I go to actually do it, um, I, I didn't write epicentral uh, that there's a big opening with huge waves or something you know it's just that there were one night just a, such a hurricane and and i couldn't sleep and it was it sounded like explosions and then my first association was uh 
that's uh, that's war you know this sounds like war it sound, made me re remind uh, remember to my times in the congo and uh, and i ran down <clears throat> at four in the morning to the malecon with my tiny camera and with my little motorbike I had this vespa and i just see these crazy waves and very oddly uh, as as i come to the malecon there's this uh, spanish cannon there is a cannon from the Spanish uh, who uh, colonial power who was why did the Spanish have have cannons anyway in, in the Caribbean to, to fight another European power you know so it's like Europeans fighting each other in, in, in the middle of uh, the Caribbean and there's this cannon and the waves break and and I so what I do it's just like I go like wow this is crazy this looks crazy and it was all lit up by by street lights on the Malecon which is which is also very unusual that i mean there's waves everywhere on the planet but very unusual that there's like hollywood lighting <laughs> like <laughs> natural <laughs> it was like street it was huge street lights and so the waves were like lit up and it's like i was just standing there with my mouth open and so what i do is i just try to take this in this moment and and just take it in and experience it and then like how can i translate it how can i how should I shoot that? How, how should I? What should I do? Yeah, and uh, and that's it. So I so I, I I just throw myself sometimes in 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 I guess in harm's way also in at least in not in not in epicenter so much but in my last few films in in Africa. But I'm not an adrenaline junkie, you know. I, I I but I I know I have to I have to. Go for it! I have to live something strong in order to uh, convey it, you know. So, uh, and it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a fantastic way to to live. I must say, you know, it's not a, and it's fantastic that you. I mean, look, even if you if you see something beautiful, if you meet someone amazing, the kids, the little prophets of Epicentro, they were just so amazing creatures, and they and they are, and by the way. And and I was like just in awe the way to see them live and to listen to their thoughts and we're we're, we're already getting questions from the audience and I'm and one of the main ones one of the first ones was uh, your how you encountered the, the kids and how you got to know them yeah well <laughs> it's very interesting because I I I kind of had forgotten because it's they they have they have become family in a way you know they they I'm their friends their friend for life and we're just we're 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 very close um i, I almost talk every day now on on, on on whatsapp it's a new thing in cuba <laughs> uh -huh. so uh, uh but uh, if a lot of people had asked me that question i never really had a good answer because i said yeah the kids from the neighborhood and uh, we we started we started to kind of uh, be be a crowd and uh, be a group that that had great time together but I realized that the main character Leonelli uh, imposed herself into the film uh, in a scene which is in the film, which is very strange. And I, I, I kind of had forgotten it, but it's, it is, there is a situation, maybe you remember when there's like 10 kids around and everyone wants to talk about this, the history of Cuba and imperialism. And, and this one kid, like at the age of nine, just beats the older guys and in, in drums into a chest and says, I'm talking, I'm talking. You. And then this old guy, older boy says, oh, she's stupid, she's too small, she, she's an idiot. And she comes back and she just stands in front of the camera and, and starts her monologue, essentially the propaganda monologue of uh, why Castro saved everyone and why imperialism should be, should, <laughs> should die. And, and suddenly she was there and then she was, and I saw this footage and I was like, that kid is just so amazing. And then I, I went back to, to that corner where like a few streets from my place where I lived and I met her parents and I showed them the footage and they were all laughing like crazy of course and and we were we were together you know but so I wasn't casting her actually she, 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 she imposed herself to the film and in a very strange way also Chaplin imposed himself into the film which is also not nothing to do with the concept of the film because yeah. Chaplin emerges from a video that this very girl Leonelli makes and she knows how to do a fast forward and 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 slow motion on my iPhone by the way 
which I didn't know before. And uh, and then and I filmed her doing this, and the kids just burst in laughter and said, "This is Charlie Chaplin when it's going fast." You know, this is also a scene. Yeah. And then that footage I showed to Una Chaplin, who's a close friend, who was Charlie's granddaughter, who was an actress, and she was in in so I sent her some footage and she was just crying she just like these kids are just too good it's just amazing and then she came and and we worked together with the kids which is the last leg of the film did you not have a relationship like, yeah. did you not have a relationship with cuba before had she been yeah una, una has a relationship with cuba because her dad uh, was um, a refugee from uh, from pinochet dictatorship and he was taken in by the Cubans, so he could. And uh, and Una was a little girl, okay. so she spent a part of her childhood in Cuba. Mm -hmm. And she has half sisters, a half sister and half brother in uh, in Cuba. Una, so she's a bit Cuban, even though she has a, a Spanish accent when she speaks Spanish. Not uh, she speaks Madrileño, yeah. like like someone from Madrid. And I try to. Find Una. She is. She is not here. I was trying to kind of get her to talk to us tonight, but I think she's somewhere in the Amazon, or I don't know where heck she is because she's she's also an amazing activist. She's uh, she's uh, she she fights for indigenous people because she's also part indigenous through her father from part Mapuche, okay. and uh, so she, she, I don't know where she is now. So okay. wish she were here tonight. Um, we would have loved to have had her, but what we can do it another time. Next time, I can. I wouldn't want to disrupt her important work. These are these yeah. are times where we need that kind of work more yeah. than ever. Um, I, I love that story about um, your characters casting themselves because I think that's a that's a that's something that um, your films are unique. But I do think that there's something about um, documentary film casting that doesn't get spoken of very often, which is that yeah. often it is the it is the willingness of a subject. To be filmed, to be a part of something that makes it happen. Yeah. You know, if that you're not subjecting somebody, when we say subject in some ways, that makes it sound like you're subjecting them to the experience. When often it takes their 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 willingness, their complicity to sort of allow it to happen, which is a, which is often how it works out really well for the film. Yeah, which comes to to the old debate of of taking pictures or taking the soul of someone. Uh, um, that is very interesting what you say, what you just said, because it, it is, it is very much a, um, a kind of um, a contract between people. You, when I film someone, I'm not just taking a picture and then run and and and, and sell it in, in in Europe. It's it is a contract that I I give my time, my attention, I listen to this person. Uh, if it's a beautiful child in Cuba or a warlord who has killed uh, thousands of people, I, I still give the attention mm -hmm. to this person. Um, and your film, you show, you showed that experience. You show somebody else taking a different approach. Right. But I show, I show also my, my uh, proximity and my f fascination to this person. And my, uh, so I, I am, I mean, I'm just in awe, not only filming, but then editing, uh, editing is such an amazing process because you're just going, back into the layers of life and you can see how people talk to each other. It's a, it's a an amazing study of life, by the way, editing a film, because you can see from one frame to the next when a thought is appearing, for example, or when, when somebody is like looking to someone else and uh, when uh, conflict starts or eases out or uh, it, it, it's just, so So I'm, I'm not only in love with the characters at the moment, but also uh, months on end uh, or years on end sometimes uh, editing you know editing your own footage can be interesting can, can be a challenge I think because mm -hmm. or I've, I've, I've having talked to filmmakers that over time because there's there's what you remember from the moment that you filmed versus what actually is there in the footage sometimes the memory of a moment is greater than the actual footages or vice versa um, so, we're, so what you're describing sounds like you're finding things that you didn't even know were valuable in the moment. Yes, and uh, that said, is I, I I edit alone a lot, but I uh, but I have a, a, a accomplice who is, a, is an amazing person, a, like a brother. I call we call each other brothers. It's if they show if they show uh, work with uh, with um, 
uh, Orson Welles in his last film, actually. Mm. And, uh, and now he works with you. <laughs> it's, very, <laughs> it's a very strange thing. But he's such a, he's a, he's a philosopher of, of image of cinema. And what he just said is interesting because I, I sometimes explain him situations where I have footage, but not quite ripe or quite good. And he says, well, that sounds so amazing. Why don't you try to dig deeper and like go back to see this person again or, mm. um, or, or film some more of this kind of, you know, of this kind of scenes because they're so, just so amazing. Um, and sometimes because we edit and, and, and shoot and edit again and shoot again. So sometimes we, we, we of course have to decide like which character is uh, going to make it into the film and which one is not. Um, and um, and I think the, the, the fact that I tell uh, my editor, who's, who's also a great friend, things that are, may not, not be in, on, yet existing in material makes me be able to, to actually go and find it, mm -hmm. this kind of material, or find yeah. more scenes from this one character, or more scenes from this one thought or, or line of thought. You know? mm -hmm. mm. Whereas if you were, if you were shooting and then had a cut of the film and then it, like, by, 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 by editing while you're shooting, you allow for yourself to, to, to find those things right. rather than to leave you open to not having what you need. Right. Yeah. And, and I think editing straight after shooting something also has, has this freshness of you. You're in the scene still and, you know, kind of, and I usually, usually make some kind of a rough uh, cooking down certain scenes. And then show it to to uh, to Eve. In in this place, by the way, this is where we edited. Uh, we come as friends. Also, this is. Uh, wow. Can you see that? Yeah, of course. Even on me. So this is the very place where I, I work with Eve. And uh, so, but but to come back to the, to the thought that you had before, I, I think this is so essential. I think especially when you talk about colonization. Exploitation, uh, extractionism. Is that an English word? Extractionism. Extracting. Uh, so yeah. you, you yeah. can go to the Congo and extract uh, minerals and oil or, or timber, or also extract images. You know, which is a, which is a very uh, old tradition of, of colonialism. You know, Not, I mean, even older than cinema, because uh, Napoleon sent uh, sent his soldiers to Egypt and uh, and his painters, and they came back with images of Cairo and. Uh, with cooking recipes and with uh, designs of how the Egyptians are building their houses and and people from Egypt and uh, so it's it, it's it's extractionism and and classical documentary made typically in the north going to the south bringing you know images and and knowledge and 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 wisdom so to say back to the wealthy part of the world uh, is is uh, is is problematic. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, I, I'm not saying that I'm a, accepted from that mechanism. I, I, I mean, a lot of people now hear you and I talk in, in the US and very few people in Cuba, but some people can see it. And, and I, I, make sure, I will make sure that uh, many Cubans can see Epicentro. I also went back, by the way, just after, uh, after Sundance to show it to, to the people in the film and to, and to the government, which was a bit of a moment of stress because i didn't know if i, I i'd have to run or or if they would let me let me show the film <laughs> again mm. that that was a, actually a, an interesting situation because um in 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 the, the screening in havana with the kids present i and with juan padron the old uh, superstar the, like the the cuban uh, walt disney who is in the film the designer mm -hmm. He was there and, and the kids were all over him. They just love it. He's just a superstar in, in, in Cuba. Um, and the film did what it can. It, they were, I was sitting with the kids in the first row. They were just laughing. They were just screaming. And got some places you could hardly hear the film anymore. They were just so happy to see themselves on the big screen. And then the film was over and they went out and they were applauded like Nina Simone. <laughs> Uh, and and then they said, like, the truth has to be said, you know, some uh, 10 year old who says that, like, there's nothing to add, you know, and everyone was disarmed. And I, I, I sensed that there were in the first 
if he rose, there were, you know, some old Stalinists and who could have like uh, chased me out or, or locked me up. But there was no way they could have done that. And then there was also a, a very lucky strike. It was that uh, Mariela Castro was in the audience, a daughter of Castro, and she took the mic and she said, this is a, you know, a love letter to our struggle. And uh, despite, you know, that it's, it's not a flattering film to the, to the Castros necessarily, you know, because you see a lot of things that they, they may not like to see. But uh, that was a really lucky moment. And I was so happy that it happened also, that, they, that I could bring back the image. And yeah. so it's just to round up the, your question before, it's like taking or giving an image, you know. Um, I, I, there's, there's, there's a way in which um, I was thinking about this today about um, observational filmmaking, which um, some of the great works of documentary are, are strictly observational. Um, that's not the mode that you operate in. There's elements of that. It's a part of what you do, but it's not all that you do. And I love how in this film, uh, what happens, I think, with observational storytelling is um, the, the observation is the text and the meaning that the filmmaker wants us to derive winds up being the subtext so they can construct something so that there's some meaning underneath the surface. Um, but what I think you allow, especially in this film, is for your, for your characters to be part of the text. They get to speak. They get to offer their opinions. They get to provide historical context. You're not the only one who provides for historical context. They do. And, you, and, and the scene that you're describing is you know, your, your main character asserting herself and basically saying, I know the history, I know the story here. Um, and, and that's extraordinary that you basically just give them that space to express themselves rather than use their lives to illustrate what you want to say exclusively. Uh, uh, by the way, in that, in that very situation, she also said, I wanted chewing gum, you know, <laughs> which is a very problematic situation because uh, the... Uh, I mean, that, I, I was thinking of this of, as a possible film in the future. Is is, is uh, sugar uh, as the ultimate destructive material, and 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 chewing gums and 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 bonbon, like sweets as the ultimate form of uh, of corruption. <laughs> as the it is an old, it's the old story of like the colonialists uh, throwing, uh, you know. Sugar in a, in a Congolese village, you know, it's a horrible thought, you know. Mm. And I didn't have a chewing gum then, but I, but she became a friend. So right. Right. it's actually right. in the film too. I, I, she says, I, I need chewing gum. <laughs> 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 Get on chicle. <laughs> yes, I remember. I remember. <laughs> so uh, I'm sorry, I, I, I forgot now what I was going to uh, answer, what you were asking actually. Um, oh, no, the, 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 you give them, yeah. you give her, and you give them throughout the film the chance to 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 provide context to provide history yeah. to basically tell give you give the information that maybe the filmmaker would ordinarily be left to give but actually they, they provide it with, within the yeah. frame itself the, the thing is about information i don't even know what what information you, a film needs needs to have i mean there's uh, information is just like we're just in a tsunami of information on, on your sure. internet on the web on the everything you know so what is our job is to transform information into into an art form and into a uh, into an experience to be shared, which is called cinema. Yeah? Yeah. Um, and so, so I mean, I, I I got sometimes when I made Darwin's Nightmare, I got I got people saying, "Oh, thank you for opening us the the eyes for for showing the scandal of uh, arms trade and the scandal of uh, this terrible fish on Lake Victoria." <laughs> And I was like, I, I, I'm not the one who talks about civil war. And you don't need Hubert to know that arms trade is is a is a is a problem since the first handshake from a colonialist uh, going to Africa. It's um, yeah. maybe I should elaborate that because I thought well, obviously that's very very interesting because the first encounter is when you meet someone in life, your your future partner in life. Uh, when you think of it, mostly. Uh, uh, all the things that define your relationship are, you know, decided within a half hour or something, mm -hmm. or sometimes within a blink. And then you, some people spend the rest of their lives to kind of un undo what they, <laughs> how their encounter was, you know. So the first encounter, or or never even managed to undo it, you know, the whole balance of power or unbalance of power, and, and the first encounter of uh, 
Europeans going to foreign lands was usually, uh, by the way, that line, it's called, we come as friends. We come as friends, we are your friends, handshake. Yeah. So a, a European uh, guy with, with a couple of gunmen oh, didn't want to shoot. He wants to be friends with the village leader and he wants to get some food and he wants to get some information. And so they shake hands if, if possible. And, and in exchange for food and, and young women that the soldiers would need, you know, because they've been walking for a month, you know, uh, water, uh, the the European would give away a gun to the village village leader. So in the first handshake uh, was uh, you know gun running, uh, corruption, prostitution, um, exploitation. And that's it, and and all the rest of history is that history in a, in a magnitude that is that is un, unthinkable. You know. But, but so, you're bringing that up because it's it's not it's not your your as a filmmaker your job is not to convey. The scope of that history it's too no exactly so I'm, I'm sorry I'm, I'm i'm making too too much detours but but I so i don't see myself as, as as the person who who needs to explain to europeans that europe europe is an exploitative power in africa and i don't need to explain anyone anything to any anyone i i, I just share uh, thoughts and experience and uh, love and and questions you know um <laughs> but so that is a very big misunderstanding and it comes from the times when documentary film uh, in part ways the, the, the word comes from which is kind of an ugly term because it comes from document and protocol absolute truth and so so I, I kind of like nonfiction better by the way mm -hmm. um, so but the history of non-fiction cinema is 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 precisely that. I, mean, I go, you know, go to the far north, go to the Congo, show show the Europeans how Congo, what Congo looks like, how the Congolese are. Also, to prepare future exploitation, <laughs> because you need to know, you know, that there's malaria, and uh, and it is essentially the same as as long before cinema, when people made uh, these big panorama paintings for. The bourgeois uh, in, uh, in in Paris and London, um, and it's also similar from the most obscene uh, ideas like the, the human zoos, you know, right? Where it's brought uh, Sudanese Congolese uh, to to a, a park in, in in London and displayed a. a, a a village where the black people would live like like at home and so that the Europeans could see them and like in the zoo which is by the way also a parallel to the scenes which are in epicentro where where you, where tourists are like plowing into the privacy of 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 Cubans in a way you know it's it's just an echo from that you know yeah um, yeah and it's not something that I want to say in a movie but i want people to maybe think of it you know if, if they're attentive and if they're sitting in a good cinema like yours and have a good surrounding and uh, and, uh, and 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 a crowd of people around who are also in the mood of of of, of experiencing something at the same time I, I love i love the moments in the film where um you have your characters in a sense, be they're, they're, they're of course very very aware of the way the tourists see them. They're very aware that there's people coming to extract from their lives to bring back home. And so, the two of my favorite moments of the film are when the kids get to swim in the hotel pool, um, and then also when they're um, they basically take the ride in the in the classic cars as if they were tourists riding around their own city yeah. that way. Um, and I'd love to talk about how those two, how those came about and, and, and your involvement with them. I, I think why, why is, why is the, most of the world seeing the Cuban revolution as something romantic and beautiful and uh, necessary? Um, because it was, it was a, a successful disobedience to patriarchy, to colonialism, to, uh, to domination. Um, successful now is, is questionable because now it's 60 years down the road and uh, but 
that drives people and like to 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 screw with with someone who like anyone uh, any one of us uh, rem remember situations when a when an idiot teacher was somehow pulled a leg you know somehow uh, taking taking a piss out of it, yeah? so so disobedience and 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 uh, how do you say uh, standing up against uh, against uh, dominance uh, is, is 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 a necessary and beautiful thing and uh the scene you're describing is uh is a uh, as itself nothing it's like it's a it's when you when you see the scene alone without the knowing the movie is uh is two kids from a neighborhood going to a five-star hotel jumping in a pool screaming and pissing in the pool and say i just pissed in a pool that means it's just it's it's essentially a a, a tourist video but in the context of the film, it's almost at the end of the film. We know the kid. We know that she's bright and beautiful and uh, and and politically aware. That scene becomes like a like powder, and it just blows it blows your mind, you know. Yeah. And that is that is the magical thing of of again of cinema because it it, it is all it's like an alchemy. It's like, like a chemical uh, <laughs> something blows, and then. And a lot of people talk about that. Oh, this this kid you know, just uh, jump in the pool and so free, and and then she says, "I just pissed in the pool." You have to pee pee in, in la piscina. <laughs> it, it it is one of the best scenes, and it it is in itself. I don't know. You can't you can't show the scene to someone and say this is a scene of a of a film that won in Sundance. It's like, are you are you are you nuts? <laughs> <laughs> but it, but in, in the context of a film, it works, and it, it, it gives you as a as a as an audience this this kind of catharsis, uh, this this liberating uh, experience. You know that the the woman uh, from a neighborhood who has seen uh, these vintage cars drive by for the last thirty years and never has a, the means to even go for a ride or and have a have a good beer afterwards. You know. Yeah, and when she can do it, she just freaks out and sings, and she's happy and beautiful. And and her concern is just to not be seen as a as a prostitute because she's with two white guys in the, in a car, right? Which is itself very painful, and 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 shows you know so much. You know, you don't need to say much more. You know, you, you know. You, I mean, I don't need a voice of saying you know prostitution is a problem in Cuba or or <laughs> everything is said in in that scene. Um, there's there's some questions and some comments about some of the things we're talking we're talking about. Um, someone says that uh, they saw their friend Fenya in a convertible, yeah. um, and that he's an amazing storyteller and fascinating guy, um, and wanted to know when the movie was filmed based on on that footage. Are you talking about Fenya being the the fake uh, gringo in the beginning? Yes, of the film? exactly. So I, th I think this person's only seen the trailer and is interested in the film and knows Fenya personally. So was excited to see. Fenya, and was wondering when you. Oh, you were, met him, right? <laughs> I met Fenya. Of course, I met yeah. Fenya. Yes, Fenya is a very impressive, very impressive individual, um, and yeah. makes and, and is and is significant in the film, a very significant character in the film. Yeah. Um, but do you want to talk a little bit, maybe, about how you met Fenya? Was that sure. a school a teaching sure. in the school? Uh, Fenya is a, is a is a super smart guy. He's a scriptwriter, and he was also teaching in in the film school in in Havana, and we were friends. Um, and he, he and I were were figuring out how to find first of all the archive footage from the Spanish American War. And I asked him to to be a part of the research uh, to figure out what was the kind of the the the, the, the birth of, of Hollywood in a way. How does how did Hollywood come up? And and, it, and Hollywood did was born in a bathtub in New York, which is a part of the story of Ipe Centro. <laughs> Don't want to give away more. <laughs> uh, uh, and so so Fenya and I were figuring out how to how to find a way to s watch these old films from 1898 made mostly by by uh, Edison's uh, Thomas Edison's uh, cameraman uh, which were de facto uh, anti-Spanish propaganda movies one minute long where you can see uh, naval battles, executions, war scenes, really fascinating stuff. And we, we had to figure out how to, 
I, I was, I, I just don't want to make a like a classical insert, you know, and, and say, oh, this is 1898, here is the footage. So we were trying to kind of uh, think of, of screening this footage and just see what people say in Havana, uh, how they react. And then, and of course, because I was, I was focusing on, on, on young humans a lot in, in Havana, we showed it in school and we showed these, these things in school. And we also through the research, we understood that cinema has never been uh, uh, mute in a way. It's always, always a cinema from the very beginning being accompanied by a, a piano player, a accordionist, or somebody who's essentially screaming like in a circus. And now you can see this and look at this. And so, so that's what we figured out from our research. And a lot of times when, when the war films were shown, it was old veterans from the civil war, for example that would explain this footage. And it was the first time, by the way, in 1898, that humanity uh, took place as in, in, in the war as like an experience because the war historically for the last 10,000 years was, was, was uh, experienced by the people who, who did the war and mostly young men. <laughs> and suddenly humanity as a whole could be there through cinema. Mm -hmm. So we recreated a situation uh, where Fenia, who is a Chilean, plays uh, uh, one of these circus masters showing these old old films. And he puts on a, a gringo hat and he has a gringo accent. And he's a de facto becoming, uh, it's like a little theater play. He's a de facto propagandist for, for, for against Spain, for, for the US, because the US had to drum up uh, you know, a lot of propaganda to make the American public opinion get ready for the war, you know, because America was a kind of tired from the civil war by the time, you know, it, and it wasn't necessarily in the mood to follow Teddy Roosevelt to take over the Pacific and, and, and the Caribbean. Right. So cinema was an was a instrument that was very necessary. So we created the situation. We just went to a school, uh, screened those those short films uh, in front of uh, school children, and we we saw in the eyes of the school children, saw where we thought to see somehow the the experience that people might have had in 1898 when they first see it, and and you now as a as a viewer of Epicentro, you see it through 1898 and through the eyes of the children, and and it's just so amazing. It's just uh, it's just it's just it's like this loop that multiplies in 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 in, in density. And then uh, Fenya again, um, the, playing the fake gringo was really exaggerating. It was like, uh, you know, this the banner of freedom, the American flag. And, and, and suddenly the teachers were looking at us uh, in a weird way and, and were looking like, what are you doing? You know, like stop the film kind of, you know. And then, and then the kids went all over us and it's like, this is bullshit. And they were essentially chasing out Fenya from the school because they, in the course of this uh, over exaggeration of propaganda I understood it that it's that it's uh, fake and that it's a uh, that the gringos should be chased out and i mean it's that is the narrative of the revolution by the way yeah. that everyone knows so that was a really really funny situation uh, but i think the 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 element of of uh, of fiction so to say uh, in in a documentary is very very open and readable i think it's not uh, you know you don't just go as a documentary filmmaker to any school in cuba and, and by chance there's somebody dressed up as a gringo showing old footage from the spanish civil war i mean it's, of course it was us uh, initiating that and i think anyone can see that you know it's essentially like i'm, I'm, I'm showing a, a play or a theater play and that still is pure documentary even though the theater play is not the real yeah. life you know so that just to to for that debate, you know, because. Uh, mm -hmm. But that, there, there's, there's, I think, I think, I think, I think it was in, implicit in what you just said. But there's a question from the audience about, um, I think, somebody who really took to heart the the thesis in a sense in the beginning of the film about um, how cinema can influence beliefs and opinions via propaganda like that, and whether that idea predated your decision to make a film in Cuba or, or, or it was the other way around in terms of like wanting to make a film by Cuba and it led you to that idea? Well, I mean, Epicentral was not, was not about Cuba and it was not, I, don't, I didn't even think in the beginning about Cuba. I thought about the, the concept of utopia. I, I thought of the concept of imperialism 
uh, which is a universal thing, you know, which is uh, which is as old as, as the as the Neolithic Revolution, I guess. You know, that's when people started to live in bigger groups and, and create empires, and 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 create all this uh, this trouble that we're now facing in a, in a in a very global scope. You know, yeah. Um, um, to, so Cuba also imposed itself. It, it is Cuba is the center of the Americas. You know, uh, uh, Havana is the epicenter of the Americas. It's geographically the epicenter, historically slave trade, uh, colonization, uh, globalization. The, even Havana was the first city, if I'm not mistaken, that was uh, was cosmopolitan. It was like there's no city uh, was inhabited by people from all continents. European cities were, you know, Europeans and maybe Africans and Indians, but no European city was so cosmopolitan as, as Havana. And uh, and the people of Havana look the way they look because uh, it's a, it is a global globalized uh, uh, cocktail, you know, of, of humans. Beautiful uh, uh, outcome of, of of globalization, by the way. <laughs> uh, but uh, so Cuba also came up relatively quickly uh, that it that it had to be there. And then I, of course, when I came across the whole. The whole story of, of the explosion of the main and it was in the port of Havana so I just thought okay this is the, this is my place where I'm going to set up camp mm -hmm. um, and when I think of it now uh, I mean if I'm not mistaken we're we're maybe in the next 10 15 years going towards like the, a big showdown like in a bad Hollywood movie the two remaining big empires on each side of the of the Pacific uh, China and America kind of who's gonna who's gonna like in a, like in a mafia movie you know who's yeah. gonna stay and who's gonna lose and uh when you when you see the world like this uh i i was just uh, two days ago listening to to chomsky and he was talking about it it's like this big big showdown um he was talking about hong kong also and hong kong is like i heard chomsky say where where um elephants uh, fight the grass is trampled you know so hong kong is one of these places that, that mm -hmm. would be in, this, in the epicenter of the conflict uh, or or taiwan but where did this big uh, showdown start that the possible big showdown of, of of imperialistic madness at the explosion of the main again because the main explosion was de facto the kick in of America taking the Pacific and and uh, and and the Caribbean and and dig a canal through Panama. Panama. That was it. It was also the explosion that kicked in what we call global trade, global globalization. That said, I'm not an anti-globalist uh, in 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 a, uh, that people may understand. I mean, I'm I'm very happy to talk to you on the other side of the planet. Uh, I, I have friends all over the globe, and I'm I'm. Uh, uh, my life is completely defined through that, you know. But uh, globalization of power, uh, of military uh, projection, is just super, super dangerous, you know. So, so, uh, so all, the, all the mistakes, all the, all the mistakes, uh, uh, all the empires uh, since let's say ten thousand years made are now, you know, exacerbated in the global in a global scope, you know. So, and when you have an empire with or with orange hair, it's uh, it's. Uh, that's another debate, I guess. I don't want to. I don't want to name him. Yeah, so let's 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 keep ourselves clean of that for for the moment. Although, I mean, obviously, of course, that's 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 where that's where the conversation is leading. That's conversation where the conversation is right now. Um, and, mm -hmm. and, uh, but but somewhat to what you're saying about not being fully anti-globalist because of the benefits of us being able to communicate like this. There's a question from the audience about. Um, Europeans or Americans in particular, I think, wanting to visit Cuba and what, how can they do so without participating in the history of colonialism? Is there a way to participate and to visit without uh, feeding into uh, the, those, those, you know, those tragic narratives and the, the sort of, uh, you know, uh, taking advantage? Yeah. And, yeah. I mean, I mean, uh, I took a, I took a jumbo jet to go to Havana. Uh, I didn't sail to Havana, and then I'm already a part of the problem, right? Um, uh, I mean, but on the other hand, I mean, of course, 
people, humans always traveled and people want to and, and have the right to meet and, and exchange and trade, of course. That's not a, I think it's always a question of, of, the, of, the, of the scope, you know, to go visit some a friend of yours is, is a great thing. If you, if you come with 20 other friends in, in someone's house, it's a problem, right? So, right. oh, it can be a problem or it can be a big party too. But uh, so I, I think it's just a question of scope, you know, and, uh, and I think this, this whole belief uh, structure that, that sometimes appears in the documentary world, you know, like to make uh, films for a better world, to change the world. It's like, um, I, I, I don't really know how to, what to say to this, you know, but uh, you, you cannot avoid genocide with movies, but, but there is a chance that you can avoid like the scope of it or avoid uh, like, or delay uh, absolute madness or or contain it a little bit i don't know maybe but it's all it's all it's not a quantitative question it's more it's not a qualitative question it's more quantitative so so i guess uh yeah if somebody wants to go to cuba i'm sure this person if if, if this person is is uh walking with open eyes uh, can have amazing encounters and it's can be uh, great for everyone you know in a way that's that's uh that's what human beings do is go go meet when when there's no virus <laughs> so which which i think i think we should i think we're about out of time but so that i want to know where is the next place you'd like to go when you can um what are you thinking about yeah. you share it all like at least just some sort of early ideas if or I, I assume you're thinking about some of that um where you are right now yeah i don't know as, as we talk i mean i i, I for now i just try to to not think of a new film because it's uh, also any kind of like some out time uh, um, after every project, but it it, it comes on its own, you know. Um, I'm writing a, a, a fiction uh, script which which has to do with uh, the collision of time. As I, I earlier said, I, had, uh, I I I grew up in in a very remote place. Uh, um, and I'm I'm now 54, but when I was a kid, uh, I was surrounded by old uh, old demons of the Third Reich. At the same time, I was surrounded by the Vietnam War because uh, the Vietnam bomber pilots were in the hotel of my parents. Uh, so I I, I I felt like World War II and the Vietnam War coins collided in time in a in a very remote place. So this this is the setting of a, of a of a, of a film I'm writing. Um, and by the way, the third element of the collision is that it's this, this sheerly, absolutely beautiful place. It's, it is literally where the sound of music was, was filmed. Mm -hmm. So in this most amazing place also is, is the birthplace of the Nazism. And it's also the place where I grew up <laughs> surrounded by, by American bomber pilots, you know? So it's a bit of a, that's why, I became a bit strange, I guess. <laughs> well, I like you're exploring that. Though. Not the reasons, but but and the other and the other story I'm working on is, is maybe nonfiction. It, it has to do with uh, this. Uh, uh, again, it's like uh, it has to do with the theme that I'm, all my films kind of uh, orbit. It has to do with uh, with the narrative of dominance and. Uh, and with the let's say now the, the the showdown of of the big showdown of global imperialism, you know. And uh, again, I'm not going to make a film that's going to explain why the Pacific might be on fire next in the next twenty years. But uh, I, I I could maybe sense or give us a sense what what we should maybe try to avoid or or, or what we should think of. <laughs> uh, but uh, Anyway, it's going to be a long journey again. You know, that it takes me a few years every time to make a film. Well, I'm glad you're. But I can't wait to see you before that in New York. I can't wait to see you before that. It'll happen. It'll happen. Yeah. And I want to. I want to make a shout out to your producer Martin Marquet, who I think is watching, and also Una and Fenya, if they ever get a chance to to see this, and the kids in Havana, um, who are all, all I know a big part of of of, of Epicentro. Um, and uh, I thought Martin's going to be. I thought Martin's going to. Be with us tonight. I, I, I thought he was. He, he, I, I, don't, I, don't, I think. I think he wanted to give you the stage. But Martin was with us on stage at Museum of the Moving Image on March 11th. Um, very 
as was Finja. So we had a we had a really yeah, amazing. That was a night. great. That was a great, great night. Really, it was a great night. But I want to thank yeah, yeah. Uh, Kino Lorber for for allowing us to do this and also for putting the film out. Um, Kino has been involved with with your films for years. So um, yeah, I just want to and thank you all for tuning in and for being here. And please see Epicentro if you haven't yet. Um, it's extraordinary, obviously. Um, and Hubert, uh, thank you for taking the time from from these new projects to spend time with thank us. Thank you, Eric. Thanks to my team. Thanks, Martin Marquet and uh, the Cuban Little Prophets, which are in Epicentro. I can't wait to see them again. Right? They're, I'm missing them so much. You cannot you cannot imagine. I was like, I was opening the film in, in Paris alone, and I was, I had thought I'm going to be just in this constant party with this. Cuban kids, but yeah, uh, next time, maybe New York too. I mean, I, New I York. We will, we will, we will have you, and we will show the film as soon as we can. You can uh, put your museum of moving images on fire, <laughs> 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 on like La Fiesta Cubana. <laughs> <laughs> nice to meet you, man. Thank you. Good to see you all. Thanks, everybody.